Now, we turn to the story of one immigrant family's fight against the gaping holes in the American justice system. Arti Shahani was born in Morocco and came to Queens, New York with her family in the 1980s. At 16, she was visiting her father, who was in New York's infamous Rikers Island prison. He was serving time for a crime that Shahani says he was unwittingly involved in. In Shahani's new memoir, Here We Are, American Dreams, American Nightmares, she comes to terms with the 14-year legal battle that her family faced and the resentment that she felt at being brought to America in the first place as a child. She spoke to our Michelle Martin about how this all shaped what the American dream looked like from her perspective. This conversation is part of our ongoing initiative about poverty, jobs, and economic opportunity in America called Chasing the Dream. I just think it's important for people to know that we do know each other. We do, yeah. Um, because we work together at NPR. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you that I remember, uh, because you cover Silicon Valley, and I remember that when you sent an email around to the staff saying that you were taking a short leave of absence because you were going to write a book about your family. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then this line comes where you say, about the time my father was arrested, and I, and I went, wait? What? Mm -hmm. I'm guessing a lot of people did not know that that part of your story. Right. I mean, you're going right to one of the reasons it started to feel so important to me to write this book is that, you know, I joke, if, you, if you've heard my voice before, I'm Indian IT lady. I give you the important news about Google, about Facebook, uh, how artificial intelligence works, disinformation campaigns disrupting democracy, very important stuff. But there is a real disconnect between my public voice and what's actually inside me. Uh, and at a point, that disconnect became unbearable for me. And I kept feeling like, girl, you have a megaphone, and you can talk to your entire country, and you're not sharing the story that's the most important to you, which is your family's immigrant journey. Why did your father get arrested? Yeah, so my dad was a shopkeeper. He started our family business on 28th Street and Broadway in Manhattan which was the exact same block where, earlier, as an undocumented immigrant, he shoveled snow for $4 an hour. Uh, we'd gotten our papers, and that put Dad on the path towards his American dream. Uh, my father was a brilliant man. He spoke six languages. He was not formerly educated, but he lived around the world. Anyway, he starts his store. Things seem to be going really well. Uh, things are going so well that we moved from Queens to New Jersey, which is like every immigrant parent's dream. Um, and one day we get a call that um, my father has been arrested and is at Rikers Island, which is a really horrible jail. Notorious. 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 Uh, very violent. Uh, in New York City, um, he's been arrested, and according to New York State, he has sold watches and calculators to the Kali drug cartel. Um, and mind you, in the 90s, I mean, the Kali cartel was the most notorious trafficking ring in the city. Um, horrific violence, dead bodies. Um, and so, you know, the case... So was, the authorities thought he was money laundering, right? He thought exactly. he was part of their scheme to, but he was to washing, hide yeah. their ill-gotten yeah. gains. And right? here's, here's, like, the really interesting thing about how the case worked. And I'll, I'll tell you about the sort of the emotional uh -huh. journey about it, but uh -huh. just the facts of the case. I remember the first time going into court, Michelle. My father and uncle were in a case together. I was a kid. I was 16 years old. And they talked about my dad as well as his little brother. My uncle was helping to run the store. They talked about them as though our family business was just a front for a cartel. It's like, you know, it just... It didn't really make sense, because my father kept saying, I'm doing what everyone is doing. I'm selling watches and calculators to anyone who will buy them. We hire uh, private defense lawyers, and the private defenders say, Mr. Shahani and Mr. Shahani, listen. No one really thinks that you're cartel ringleaders. No one thinks that. But they started a case, and they want a conviction out of the case. Just agree to an eight-month sentence. They're offering you eight months. Take it. Because if you don't take it, and if you go to trial, you will face the trial penalty. What's that? Oh, if you exercise your constitutional right and you're convicted, mm -hmm. you'll face a decade. You'll face longer than a decade. So, small-time shopkeepers, what do you want? Eight months you can get it over with or gamble. While the criminal justice system is not about innocence and guilt, it's about risk and reward. And so my, par my father and uncle did, uh, statistically, what everyone does, take the plea. So they agree the plea bargain is eight months each. 
They each took the guilty plea. The prosecutor agreed to let one man go, then the other man, serve sentences. Uh, Consecutively. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so our business, the so-called cartel front, wouldn't collapse. Well, if we're drug traffickers and our business is a front for a cartel, and that's why these men must go away, then why are you bending over backwards to structure a plea deal so that one can stay out at each time? Didn't quite make sense, but we got the point. The point is they wanted a conviction. The state wanted a conviction. Mm -hmm. My uncle goes in first. He's supposed to do his time, come out, my dad will go in. Matter should be behind us. That's not what happens. The eight-month sentences ended up spiraling into a 14-year legal battle. Um, because deportation by the feds came in as a second surprise punishment. My uncle did not do eight months because of an administrative error by New York State. He did two and a half years. The day he was supposed to come home to us, um, and we, I mean, we jumped hoops to get mm -hmm. him out. The day he was supposed to come home to us, he goes missing. For four days, we have no idea where he is. The homecoming party turns into a search party. That's when we discover that deportation is going to be a second punishment given to my family. And because because your parents had green, your family had green cards at that point. They weren't citizens. Well, some of and us. So, my dad so. and uncle were lawful permanent residents, green card holders. Some of us were naturalized U.S. citizens, um, and that was part of the surprise. Is that you know, we thought, but but wait, we're legal. W what do you mean you're going to toss them out? It made no sense to me. Um, you know. Um, that two men who'd served their time, who were long-term residents, who already had their papers, who had family members who were U.S. citizens, would be subject to automatic life exile. But that was the law. Mm -hmm. And I needed to tell that story. I have to tell you, one of the things about your book that I so love is that you're so honest mm -hmm. about this whole range of emotions. Yeah. Your resentment. Yeah. And having to deal with this, yeah. your resentment that this whole situation really dominated your teenage years and your early adult yeah. years, because you didn't just let it go. You did not let it go. You basically, I don't know how to put this, you became an immigration activist. You became kind of a, um, a jailhouse lawyer isn't quite right, but you really educated yourself about yeah. it. You, you master all yeah. the details. I wasn't you locked up, but. Marshaled yeah. there. Uh -huh. Uh, legal defense. I mean, you yeah. organized your father's legal defense, basically starting when you were 16 years old. Well, it's, it's interesting, actually. And I would say I started in earnest when I was 19. I remember the exact turning point. Sure. But, but I have to say this. I, you know, when I was 16 and I visited dad for the first time at Rikers, and I was so ashamed of him, and I'm like, how could you do this to me? Um, I remember going to visit him with my mom and my brother, going to a huge open-air gym where you have families visiting their loved ones. I remember looking around, and just a sliver of a thought I had, the sliver of a thought was, where are all the white criminals? Why don't I, New York doesn't have white criminals? And it's not that that thought dominated, the shame dominated at the time, over the years, when the case dragged on, when eight months spiraled into, here's a surprise second punishment, when horrible things were happening in the case and, mis you know, sort of what they call administrative errors were constantly, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, screwing us over. That shame, thankfully, it shattered, and then just indignation rose. And that's when I got incredibly involved in advocating for my father. Talk to me, if you would, about the shame. Because this is, again, something that I don't think a lot of people hear about. Yeah. What was the shame? Was it the shame of your father being locked up or was it the shame of not being this kind of model, the model minority that we keep hearing so much about? I think it's a dissonance that a lot of people feel in this country because there's, you know, my book, it's called, it's Here We Are, Statement of Fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the subheading is my thesis about America, American Dreams, American Nightmares. Mm -hmm. I have lived the American dream, and the nature of that dream is you get to walk into rooms you never knew existed. You get tapped for things that are beyond your dreams, beyond what you could imagine. And you leap in ways that would not have happened in other places. That is the dream, and I have lived it. My father lived the nightmare. Once you are targeted, once you are tagged, 
you were never let out of the box that defines you, in my father's case, as quote unquote criminal alien. Mm -hmm. Why did your parents come to this country to begin with? I mean, this is no oh. easy thing. I mean, you were born in Morocco. Yeah. And uh, I remember at one point in the, in the book, you talk about some of the conditions of, you know, like just saying, you, 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 this is your American dream to work 14 hours a day, to not be able to eat meat, to have, you know, roaches crawling up your clothes. Yeah. So not just on the clothes, by yeah, the way. Yeah. I woke up more than once with the roach on my bare skin. Yeah. I mean, that was my childhood. And so, so why did they come here to begin with? That three was, small children. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's actually, it's funny because that's like an investigative aspect of this book is mom would always say, we did it for a better life for you kids. I was working through a lot of resentment when I was writing this book. Um, not just resentment to my country, but to my family. Um, and I was like, mom, we had a really crappy life. What do you mean a better life for us kids? And I was very angry when I was asking her about it. And then she finally told me that the specific reason my parents chose to leave Morocco where I was born and my siblings were born, cross the Atlantic, overstay visas, be undocumented, raise three little kids that way, is that she herself was fleeing a really abusive situation. Back home in many countries, many of us have what are called joint families. So the wife marries the husband and then lives with his parents and brothers. Mom had that arrangement in Casablanca where I was born. Turns out, and I didn't know this, that her mother-in-law, my grandma, was a really abusive woman. Um, my grandma would throw plates at my mom if mm -hmm. she didn't like the food that was prepared. She wouldn't allow my mom to open the refrigerator without permission <laughs> or leave the house without mm -hmm. permission. She wouldn't allow my parents to sleep in the same room. Uh, this is actually a very embarrassing fact to share, but my, my father's mother made him stay in her room and made my mom sleep in the living room. Mm -hmm. My mom is the most resilient human being I know. I don't know anybody with more capacity and appetite for life than my mother. And it was only in the process of writing this book I learned that she actually attempted to take her life mm -hmm. because something pretty horrific happened. And my father finally agreed, okay, let's take the kids and go. And this is the funny thing about so many of our immigrant stories is crossing the ocean and living in America is in some ways easier than going to try to live across the street. Because if you're close to your family, you have to be right there with them. Um, but if you're in America, you can say, oh, it's for the kids. And here's the thing is that my mother hungered for dignity, mm -hmm. for freedom, for herself and for her daughters, two daughters, one son. And she wanted for us to have a life that she could not have. Well, what, what was the toll on you and, and also on your mother? I stopped going to college. I stopped going to college so I could fight to keep my father here. I will say this though, um, there is a lot of pain I am recounting in this book, but something I realized while writing it is part of what fueled me in my fight is first of all, the confidence that America has given me that we belong here. The laws say one thing, but the culture says another, mm -hmm. and that culture emboldened me to fight the way that I did. And two, I have a super loving family. The thing is, is that when you're going through such tremendous ups and downs, when you're going with it, through it with people you love and who love you, I mean, that's a blessing. That's actually a blessing. You know, mm -hmm. this, this book gave me a working definition of love. Everyone, you know, we think about it, it's the greatest question on earth, what is love? For me, what I realized is love, of, love is that process when you turn toward as opposed to away from someone who is in pain. Mm. When you can do that, when you can be fearless, when you can not worry that their crisis will hurt your life, be bold, you get some of the most joyful experiences you can ever have, mm. you know. I gotta ask you about this crazy scene that comes early in the book where you actually meet the judge who sentenced your father. During a trip to New York, I take the train out to Queens. I go to his chambers, knock on the door. He opens the door. Hadn't seen him since I was a teenager, sitting in the pews. Mm -hmm. First words out of his mouth, your father and your uncle should never have taken that guilty plea. What a mistake. And I have, Shocking. To, I have to explain mm -hmm. that as a journalist, 
Oh, that would be a really interesting find. Tell me more, Judge. What do you mean? As a daughter, I felt like the soul leapt from my body and I needed to collapse. It hurt. So badly. It hurt. So badly to know that I, all that you went through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was, it was funny. I found. Tell me why. Why shouldn't he have taken that plea? I think you can find a way that they, as small business owners, were cutting corners. You could find a reason that, you know, they should be convicted of something, much like most small business owners, and as I've come to learn as a business correspondent, big business owners. But the judge's point was that you guys did not play your hand right. You had so much more to bargain with than you realized, and you could have done much better than you did. You just folded way too early. That's ultimately what he went. And I didn't actually learn that that's what he meant that first visit to him. Mm -hmm. I was incapacitated. He told me that. I sat on the sofa. I nodded politely with him. I wanted to get the hell out of his mm -hmm. office. I got out of his office and I just wept. What happened to your dad? You know, in the end, you were able to yeah. keep him in this country, but, but then what? Mm -hmm. Well, part of what I'm exploring in this book, again, I needed to write this book to figure this out for myself was, was it worth it? Was it worth fighting for dad? Um, ultimately, we were able to keep him in this country. It was at a huge expense to him and to the rest of us. Um, he'd had multiple heart attacks. He had lost all of his teeth. Um, we had to do multiple amputations until finally they sawed off his leg. He was in a really deep depression. You know, I had a situation where I had life beyond this legal case. It was my first rodeo. It wasn't his first rodeo. Mm -hmm. So I can reflect back on this and think, wow, what an incredible chapter in life. Amazing leadership training. For dad, it was destruction. What happens when you derive your purpose from working and you can't work again? When your community has rejected you? People won't return your calls. That's what my father lived. And he was a good man. I mean, he was a good man. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, he was able to stay here, but I am reflecting on the cost of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the title of the book, Here We Are, mm -hmm. You're Here, yeah. um, American Dreams, American Nightmares. Um, what are your reflections now about the American dream? Mm -hmm. And what is the American nightmare, if you could, if you yeah. could sum it up? Yeah, I mean. Does the American dream still live? Yeah. It definitely does. After all you saw, after all the screw-ups, all the unfairness, all the bigotry, my life corruption. Is my life is mm -hmm. proof of it. I mean, my mother reminds me this. The nightmare is what my father lived. Mm -hmm. My father is a migrant having to start over each time he came into a new place. He was doomed or fated to a life of constant irrelevance. We were low-end globalization, not high-end globalization, low-end globalization. And dad had to pay the price each and every time, especially in this country. He told me one time I visited him in Rikers, he's like, Arthi, all the things I've seen in my life I haven't even told you about, I have never seen something as bad as this. It's the criminal justice system. We have a mass incarceration system. We now have a mass deportation system that I've written about that's built off of that system, one on top of the other. That's a nightmare of this country. It's a cancer in this country that we have to get past. We have to deconstruct and build, build a better system. The dream is that ability to leap and wander into places where you didn't even think you belonged. In most of the world, people are forced to stay where they came from, okay? Very calcified social structures keep you there. My mother is the reminder to me to be grateful because my mother, no matter what happened to her husband, I mean, she was there, she became my father's nurse because he had fallen so ill in the process of facing these things. No matter what happened to her husband, my father, we had to amputate a leg. I mean, he was literally decaying as this was going on. No matter what happened to her husband, she can tell her daughter, Arthi, be grateful for the life you have here because it's much better than anything you would have had back there. Trust me, I know. Mm -hmm. 